Good morning. My name is Matt Chinister. I'm the Director of Technical Sales at ChemDAC Incorporated. ChemDAC manufactures and sells gas detection systems to ensure worker safety. Our focus is to monitor cell processing departments and endoscopy in order to be aware of the environment in the rooms and maintain chemical levels below regulatory limits for hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, and ethylene oxide. I'd first like to say thank you to Isham for hosting the online education conference and all of you for joining the webinar today. For today's live session, we are proud to be joined by Mike Matthews. Mike is the Vice President of Analytics and Resource Development at Beyond Clean, the premier resource for education in the medical device reprocessing industry. He currently serves as the Director of Clinical Education and Training for Northfield Medical. He has previously held the position of a Manager of Sterile Processing at Baptist Health Medical Center, and he has served as an ex subject matter expert for Isham. He has published several articles in trade journals, and today he will be talking about emergency preparedness and sterile processing departments and how to make sure you have a plan when it comes to dealing with emergency situations. He'll also be giving another talk today at 1 p.m. on the importance of chemical monitoring in your department and why monitoring is essential, specifically hydrogen peroxide, parasitic acid, and ethylene oxide. And that's for another half credit as well, or CE. Um, if we have time at the end, we will would like to answer some questions, and if not, we will email you a response. Uh, now I'd like to hand it over to Mike. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be here today. I'm very excited. Uh, like I said, I'm Mike Matthews. I'm one of the co-hosts of Beyond Clean. Today, we're going to be talking about emergency preparedness. What is your plan to deal with disaster? We're going to look at several facets of this, and but kind of the key theme that's going to run through all of them is that you have to be prepared ahead of time because disasters tend to not let you know when they're gonna happen. And so being prepared is really the key to being successful when it comes to uh, emergency situations. So today's objectives are to identify what emergency situations are. We're gonna differentiate between internal and external emergencies. We're gonna understand the impact of potential adverse effects resulting from emergencies and then we're going to talk about some strategies to actually prepare for an emergency. So first off, let's talk about what is an emergency. Now we're going to look at a few definitions and each one kind of has their own slant to it based on who's giving the definition. But the key things that I want you to really pay attention to are what are the commonalities to all of them. So first, let's get like a, a very high level view of what is an emergency. So uh, let's start with Webster's, always a good place to start. Uh, Webster's defines an emergency as an unforeseen combination of circumstances or the resulting state that calls for immediate action and an urgent need for assistance or relief. So kind of those key phrases that we're seeing there are unforeseen, right? Because again, uh, disasters tend to not warn you that they're coming. Uh, and it requires immediate action. Next, uh, let's take it a little bit more specific to the hospital world, and let's look at what the Joint Commission says an emergency is. And the Joint Commission defines an emergency as an unexpected or sudden event that significantly disrupts the organization's ability to provide care or the environment of care itself, or that results in sudden and significantly changed or increased demand for the organization's services. So you can already see kind of two separate uh, definitions kind of emerging here where one phase of or one type of emergency is one that, in, that disrupts a facility's ability to provide care. And the other kind of side to it is maybe it's something that happens outside that causes a massive demand for that service uh, that the hospital provides. Uh, for example, I, I remember during my time as a technician uh, in uh, central Arkansas, there was a tornado in a town uh, nearby uh, us and we were the closest hospital. And so that's something that happened, you know, 15 miles away, but because it happened there, all of a sudden we have such a huge rush incoming of patients who need triage that the emergency department was doing triage in the parking lot because there were just so many, it's such a high influx at once that uh, it simply the building couldn't even hold as uh, enough of them. And so that's, that's kind of the way that works out that, you know, it's possible that events could happen outside that completely change the dynamic internal to that hospital. 
Next, let's look at Homeland Security. Now, Homeland Security defines an emergency as any incident, whether natural or human caused, that requires responsive action to protect life or property. Now, the really important phrase that I wanna point out on this one is that phrase, protect life or property. Uh, let's not kid ourselves here that when we're talking about emergency preparedness, especially within the healthcare arena, we're talking about things that protect people's lives. Uh, our ability to respond to an emergency can have a dramatic impact on how many people die, how many people have life altering injuries. It could even affect us personally. You know, some, some of these emergencies affect uh, the internal areas of the hospital. That's gonna be the employees, us, the frontline people. And so this is really critical to think of this in terms of, this is not theoretical, uh, and hopefully, hopefully none of this will ever happen, uh, but I guarantee you somewhere it will. And when it does, it'll be critical to react properly to protect life. Now, next uh, is an interesting one, the Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. Uh, now, this is an important one. It defines an emergency as any occasion or instance for which, uh, in the determination of the U.S. president, federal assistance is needed to supplement the state and local efforts and capabilities to save lives and protect property. Again, there's that key phrase again, save lives, protect property, and public health and safety, or to lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe in any part of the United States. And uh, this is what's going on very often when you, you know there's a disaster somewhere and the news will come on and say, the president has declared such and such county as a federal disaster zone. Well, that's the president using the powers vested from this act to say, essentially, this area needs federal help. It's, it's too much for the state or the local efforts. And so, therefore, uh, we have to provide extra care in order to, again, save that life and protect that property. Now, ECRI, I, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not. Sometimes you'll hear them, uh, hear, hear that uh, acronym as ECRI. Uh, they are a patient safety and advocacy group, and they had an interesting statement about this too, where they say that no longer is it sufficient to manage emergencies as they arise. Rather, hospitals must plan and prepare in advance to mitigate, respond to, and recover from natural and human-made emergencies and disasters. And ECRI being a patient safety advocacy group, essentially what they're saying is, is that if you're planning on shooting from the hip on this, it will hurt patients. That's not acceptable. The best way to protect people is to prepare in advance. Now, going back to the Joint Commission again, uh, Joint Commission has stated that all organizations must have an emergency management program, emergency management plan, or emergency operations plan, depending upon the size of the program or facility, so that an individual's care can be continued effectively in the event of emergency situations. An emergency management plan should indicate specific responses to the types of disasters likely to be encountered by the organization. So essentially what they're saying is, you have to plan this in advance and have different plans for different types of emergencies, right? And don't be surprised if when the Joint Commission comes to do an inspection, if this is one of the things they ask to see, they want to know what are your emergency management plans and who's in charge of this? Who are the groups that are, that are designing this plan? And finally, we're gonna look at OSHA. And of course, OSHA stands for the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And their focus is on employee safety. Now, OSHA standards require an emergency action plan as well as a fire prevention plan. And each one has minimum elements that are outlined in following standards. And, and uh, we'll, we'll look at those in a little bit, uh, but the main thing I wanna emphasize is, is that this is OSHA saying this, so this is a regulation. This has to be in place or there will be uh, penalties involved for not having one of these in place. So it's very critical, do you know it? And, and is it up to date? Uh, some of the things that are required within these standards, uh, Fire prevention plan must list all major fire hazards, proper hair, care and handling and storage procedures for hazardous materials, where those potential ignition sources are, where the control is for it, uh, the type of protection that's necessary for anybody who's responding to these, uh, 
what are the procedures to control the accumulation of flammable and combustible waste materials? Uh, where are the regular maintenance being done for safeguards installed on heat producing equipment? They'll want to see this potentially. Uh, they'll want to know who the job or the title of the employee responsible for maintaining equipment to prevent or control sources of ignitions or fires. And they want to know who's in, who's responsible for all of these things. Uh, so a few minimum elements of an emergency action plan, uh, procedures for reporting the fire or other emergency procedures for an emergency evacuation, including the type of evacuation, the exit route assignments, procedures to be followed uh, by employees who remain to operate critical plant operations before they evacuate, procedures to account for all employees after evacuation. Uh, you know, at a facility I, I worked at uh, one time, the if you were in decontamination, you couldn't hear a fire alarm going off, right? How do you know the poor people in decontam who are just working their tails off uh, don't get left behind in this in this uh, event of a fire? You know, that's a very critical failure for our building design that we didn't have adequate fire alarms in that department. So if you're aware of these things, you know, by OSHA standards, you have to get them addressed. And then you have to have a way of making sure that nobody got left behind. Uh, procedures to be followed by employees performing uh, rescue or medical duties, and the name or job title of every employee who may be contacted by other employees who need more information about a plan or explanation about their duties. So there's a lot in there. And again, that's coming from OSHA. So it's regulatory, it's required. And so if you don't have this, or maybe you don't know what some of these things are, you need to go ask and you need to make sure that it's in place. Again, I can't emphasize enough that the primary purpose is to protect patients and protect yourself. So you're only helping life whenever you check these things out. Uh, next, let's look at the different types of emergencies. Now, I referenced that there were really two kind of phases that we were going to look at. And you can see that in the definitions. First type is internal. Now, these are things that are happening inside the facility. So for an example of this would be an uh, internal fire. Uh, a chemical spill or maybe toxic gas, which could include sterile exposure, power outage, or even a water event. And water event's kind of an interesting one because it could be an internal or an external, depending upon where the water's coming from. Uh, Bob Mars, who is uh, with Beyond Clean also, always tells a, a really interesting story about his uh, sump pump on his cart washer one time uh, getting clogged up and it just flooded his entire department. Uh, that's an internal emergency, and uh, it, it's a very serious one because it, it very much hampers the ability of sterile processing to do their job and feed instruments into the OR, and all because of a pump. Uh, you know, so uh, one very interesting internal emergency that happened, and again, these things happen, happened uh, not too incredibly long ago. You probably read about it on social media where a, a low-temperature sterilizer, uh, a V-Pro, had been serviced. And uh, shortly after it had been serviced, uh, it caught fire. And uh, it was a, a very serious disaster. You can see from the picture on the screen the kind of damage that was done, uh, the damage to the ceiling. Uh, you know, again, they had to have a plan in place for this in order to react to it properly. But uh, you can see some of the damage that was done. Every employee had to be tested for exposure to hydrogen peroxide. Uh, the hydrogen peroxide had penetrated every set that was in the room. Uh, anything that was not made of metal and all implants had to be discarded. Uh, you know, so massive cost associated with that. Uh, and of course, the one thing they learned, uh, the department had learned was that H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide can spontaneously combust if it comes in contact with an absorbent material. Of course, uh, you know that all low temp hydrogen peroxide sterilizers are very clear about not allowing cellulose material into the sterilizer. Well, the reason for that is because cellulose has this nasty habit of absorbing that hydrogen peroxide. And if it absorbs too much of it, it can spontaneously combust. So again, I guarantee you, nobody woke up that morning and said, all right, you know what? We're gonna have a department fire today. Uh, so everybody get excited. I hope you know what, you do, what you're doing. No, it just happens. And uh, how you prepare ahead of time is going to affect how well you were able to respond to that. Now, next, let's look at the second type of emergency, which is the external emergency. So here we have uh, weather, for example, an earthquake or a flood or a tornado, like I mentioned early, earlier, or a mass casualty event, uh, maybe a pandemic. Sound familiar? 
uh, biological or chemical agents that have been released, such as in a terror attack, all of those, those are going to be those things that just cause that massive rush of people who all of a sudden need hospital care. Uh, and boy, what an incredible reminder of how this can happen. Uh, we did an interview on the podcast with a gentleman who, uh, Dwayne Taylor, who didn't even work at one of the hospitals, but he was in Las Vegas for the 2017 uh, Route 91 mass shooting event, which became uh, the worst mass shooting event in U.S. history. Uh, 58 people were killed, 400 were injured by bullets, and then an additional 400 plus were injured by the panic that ensued afterwards. And uh, Dwayne tells the story about how, uh, you know, as a volunteer, he uh, went to one of the hospitals and he had a lot of experience from the military and as a surgical technologist. And they asked him to go to the sterile processing department to help them prioritize what is it that they need to be focusing on. And so I, I think that very frequently we understand that when one of these disasters happens, uh, it, increases, it, it causes an increase in need for things like the emergency room. But we forget that, you know, if, if those patients are really badly hurt, they've got to go to the OR. And if they're going to the OR, they've got to have instruments to do their job. So again, this is one of those things that we have to think about ahead of time because nobody who woke up that morning in Las Vegas knew that they were about to be ground zero for one of the worst disasters or one of the worst uh, mass shootings in U.S. history. But they had they had to be able to react uh, because there's no telling how many more people could have died if the reaction wasn't adequate. Now, uh, every time there's a disaster uh, or an emergency, there are potential adverse effects that can trickle down. Uh, departmental contamination, like we talked about in the VPRO fire, uh, failure to process, uh, even maybe like a departmental flood that's only in only in sterile processing. But if you can't process the instruments necessary to feed the OR, that could have a, a chain effect. Uh, it could cause a shutdown of the facility. Uh, it could cause flooding, loss of power, the inability for staff materials or supplies to arrive at the facility. Think about for a flood, for example, uh, if all the routes coming into the hospital are cut off, how does your hospital keep enough material? How do, how do you provide materials to uh, continue caring for the patients who are there? Uh, there can also be building evacuations. There can be an influx of surgical procedures, like in the case of the Route 91 shooting, uh, where, where there's people who need to have bones fixed from being trampled. There's people who need to have arteries clamped to keep from bleeding out. And of course, structural damage in the case of something like uh, a flood or an earthquake, uh, for example, where uh, it can cause the building to no longer be safe. So the really important key to this, and I've already mentioned this a, a few times, but it bears repeating, is that how will your team, how well your team will uh, handle continued patient care in the event of emergency situations is going to depend largely on your ability to prepare. Now, CMS has a really good take on this, and I really like this statement from them, that CMS regulations require organizations to take a comprehensive, consistent, flexible, and dynamic regulatory approach to emergency preparedness and implement a response that incorporates, this is key, incorporates lessons from the past, combine them with proven best practices of the present, in an emergency operations program. So the thing is that we're gonna look at all these disasters that have happened. We're going to see how people respond and we're gonna learn what we can. We're going to apply it to our context with the best practices we have so that we can be prepared for that unknown future. Cause you can't predict the future, but what we can do is look at the past and look at the present to be prepared. So we're gonna suggest kind of a way of looking at this uh, which kind of divides emergencies into three categories. Uh, level three is minor, level two is moderate, level one is severe. Uh, in a level three minor emergency, this would be uh, a very uh, localized event. This is like an accident involving a limited area that causes minimal impact or interruption to the campus. So for example, this would be a, a chemical spill of something like a disinfectant, not a sterilant, uh, but a disinfectant or maybe one of those little uh, floods like we talked about with Bob's story where the sump pump uh, flooded and uh, you know you had to cut off water to the decontam area, that type of thing, but it really only affects one department. 
Uh, so this, for example, you prepare for uh, just within your department, getting your plans together. What do we do in the event where we spill something? What do we do if there's a, a minor flood? But then we move into level two, a moderate emergency. And this is something that begins to affect a larger area. And what I hope you see is that as the area of influence gets larger, the more people who need to be brought in to discuss the plan, it's going to grow as well because they too are being affected and your ability to coordinate with each other is going to depend largely on how well everybody communicates and how well everybody understands the, each other's roles. So a moderate emergency is a significant emergency that disrupts an entire floor and may require assistance from outside resources departments or facilities. So for example, a fire. Uh, you're going to have to call the fire department. That may make your OR no longer usable. Uh, in the event of the fire that we discussed earlier, I guarantee you that OR was no longer functioning. Number one, uh, because the fire department had to be in there and probably contaminate a lot of stuff. Number two, the smoke and the hydrogen peroxide had contaminated everything. And number three, anything that had been used wasn't going to get processed either. So the whole OR was affected by that. Uh, but there had to be plans in place for who's calling the fire department who guides them to where they go. Uh, <clears throat> other things are chemical spills, such as parasitic acid or formaldehyde, very large spills uh, that may require specialized response groups. And then we go into the level one, which is the worst of the worst, the severe emergency. Uh, these are wide ranging and complex effects that require facility wide cooperation and extensive coordination with external agencies and resources. Now, this would be a very large chemical spill, such as ethylene oxide, or maybe when the fire alarms go off, when those fire alarms go off, you don't know how bad the situation is. So it's always best to assume that it's a severe emergency or a major flood, for example. Uh, you know, that's going to cause uh, disruptions to the supply chain. It could uh, increase the amount of people coming in. You know, these are very key and you're probably going to have to communicate throughout the, throughout the facility and with outside resources to make sure that you can still get those uh, supplies in to do your procedures and to take care of those patients who are already there. Um, ethylene oxide is a very important one because, it, you know, if uh, you aren't monitoring, how do you know that ethylene oxide is leaking out into your department. This has happened. In fact, this actually happened uh, to uh, a former boss of mine before I, I worked for them. Uh, they, they were in a department and this department had an old ethylene oxide system. They weren't using the sterilizer anymore, but the lines were still in place. And little did they know that one of the lines had developed a crack and uh, ethylene oxide had leaked down into the department. They had no monitoring system of any sort. Uh, they didn't realize that it had spilled out until uh, all the pay, all, I'm sorry, all the uh, employees all of a sudden just started getting sick, just violently ill immediately. Uh, you know, uh, how do you know that one of these things is taking place without some sort, some form of early warning or early monitoring system? So uh, what systems does your team have in place to become aware of those most severe internal uh, emergencies? So for example, you've got fire alarms for fires. Do you have a chemical monitoring system that lets you know that uh, the that levels are reaching a point where this is a level two or a level three type of disaster and you need to go ahead and call in uh, resources to help you deal with that? So how do you prepare for an emergency? We're going to go through each of these very briefly, but first thing is we want to perform a hazard vulnerability uh, risk analysis. We want to develop policies and procedures and create emergency cards potentially. We want to do a lot of education and training. We want to implement practice drills internally and in coordination with local fire and rescue. And we want to audit supplies and equipment on hand. So what is a hazard vulnerability analysis, a HVA? A hazard vulnerability analysis and risk assessment are systematic approaches to identifying hazards and risks that are most likely to have an impact on healthcare facilities and the surrounding community. So look at what are we actually at risk for? Is there a river nearby that floods regularly? What kind of sterilants do we have on hand? Uh, you know, these are the types of things that we have to be, that we have to look at to let us know uh, that a potential emergency is possible. And then we wanna develop those policies and procedures. And, and again, very much you want to uh, 
grow these uh, interdisciplinary teams, especially get the risk management team to address the findings from the HVA, reevaluate, develop your policies and procedures annually, update them regularly to ensure clear channels of communication throughout your organization. Uh, a good idea is to have emergency carts with PPE, trauma sets, sutures, laceration kits, gloves, saline, lactated ringers, all the things that would be necessary in the case of one of these major emergencies. Also, we need to have education and training because again, I know everybody rolls their eyes when it comes time for you know, your fire preparedness and everybody uh, gives this big sigh when the fire drill happens. And everybody says, oh, I don't wanna do that because uh, it takes away from the day and I'm busy. Don't they know I've got stuff going on? But uh, listen, your ability to respond in the moment of an emergency is going to be critically impacted by how well you're educated and trained on those procedures because when it happens it's too late to be prepared it's too late to try and begin preparing then right uh, that's the nature of the emergency so you need to talk about what do we do for chemical spills what what is our role in the case of an evacuation a fire do we need to know cpr one of the facilities i worked at required every single employee to be cpr certified i think that's great because you never know when you're going to be the only one with a patient who collapses and also, uh, do you need to have first aid available? Implement those practice drills over and over and over again, because that's the way that they become natural. Uh, overhead calls, evacuations, fire, uh, practice drills, and of course, area monitoring as well. So during an emergency, uh, kind of a, a sort of plan that we have that we, that we recommend uh, just to help you navigate anything is first off, consider. Consider and assess the situation. You wanna communicate the situation to the appropriate personnel or emergency services, whether that be fire, police, or whoever. Uh, you wanna contribute, jump in and help where you can following the established policy and procedures. Don't just do it wildly, know your role and know what you're trained for. And then contain, contain that situation as best as you possibly can. And then afterwards, once this emergency has passed, talk about it, develop a, uh, an action plan afterwards. Uh, think about what did we do well? What did we do poorly? What can we do better next time? It's very important to have that debrief so that you know how to improve next time. So in summary, as we close up, uh, emergency situations are defined by multiple organizations and have three different classifications. Internal emergencies are those that have a problem or cause inside the facility and external emergencies have a problem or cause outside the facility. All emergent situations come at a cost to the healthcare function and patient safety, and preparing for an emergency is the responsibility of each healthcare facility and governing organizations provide that guidance. So know what it says and be ready. As we finish, I just want to say thank you to everybody for your time. Tune in for our next presentation later today, and we have a, a, lot, a live demonstration, I believe, on July 8th. So I'm going to turn it back over to Matt with the questions. I think we've got a few minutes uh, that we can go through and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Mike. That was great. Um, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to present today and, and, and stepping into the role and, and doing it very well. Um, I believe I just wanted to make clear, thanks everybody else to joining as well and, and make sure you stay tuned at the end here to get your CE credit code. Um, and, and thanks for watching. Um, Mike, what, I'll just ask one, one or two questions real quick while we have sure. a minute. Um, what, what do you think is kind of the most important piece to putting together the emergency uh, preparedness, you know, like plan? Uh, what, what, can, what can they do and what's the most important piece to that? Yeah, in my opinion, it's the interdisciplinary team that has to be put together, right? Do not assume that you personally have all the information necessary. Uh, get the team together. Everybody's going to have a different piece of the pie, and it's critical that that discussion take place uh, in order to be able to uh, flesh it out properly. If, if it's just one person trying to do it, I promise you it will be inadequate and it won't go anywhere. And then the other thing I think is important in all this stuff that we discuss in monitoring and, and emergency preparedness, if I'm just one person that's nervous about it and I think the plan should be better, you know, what's the best way to go about it? And usually what's the response of, of managers in the departments and stuff about hearing these issues? Yeah, I think for the most part, especially if you're talking to the right people, whether that be infection prevention or risk management, you know, they want to know your input. 
uh, they have such huge broad scopes of, of, of service that they understand that it's very easy to miss something. And so I, I think you'd have a hard time finding a risk manager who just assumes they know everything already. Uh, so go to them with your concern, have it very clearly laid out, and I guarantee you uh, they will want to help you. Thanks, Mike, and thanks to all of you. Thank you.